So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Charlotte Cooperwasser. Charlotte is a, a professor uh, in the Department of Developmental Molecular and Chemical Biology here at Tufts, uh, and she's the director of the Raymond and Beverly Sackler Convergence Laboratory. I mean, you'll hear a little bit about that from Charlotte's talk. Uh, so without further ado, Charlotte, if you would come up and tell us about strategies and mechanisms to prevent disease. Thank you, Phil, for that introduction. Um, and thank you all for coming uh, and joining us this morning for our first annual symposium. I hope um, you'll uh, learn a lot about what we're doing here, what we're trying to achieve, and, and take, away some of the, um, take away with you some of the exciting developments and engage in us in, in their collaborations or convergence, because that's ultimately um, the goal of what we're trying to do here. So um, as uh, Phil mentioned, um, uh, I am the director of the Raymond and Beverly Sackler Convergence Lab. And um, this really sort of came about because we right now, life sciences, um, is in the midst of a revolution. Um, as you can appreciate, the last decade has really brought forth uh, technology-driven um, innovations, um, massive data, um, wonderful um, advances in the physical sciences, in the life sciences, and the engineering sciences. Um, but at the same time, with these massive um, expansions and innovations, there's actually been uh, a contraction in the funding mechanisms and in the funding of, of this kind of work. And traditionally, we, we as researchers have been working sort of in silos. We have a problem, uh, either in biology or engineering or chemistry. We work in our labs to try to solve that problem, and we're generally funded to do that. Um, but because of this contraction, the, the silo model is becoming more and more challenging um, simply because we can't uh, innovate and, and produce in the same amount, um, the same quantity, given the amount of funds. And so uh, one way to sort of overcome this has been uh, to think about branching out and, and, and um, forging uh, interdisciplinary collaborations. And, and that's really coined the this term convergence. This is really coming about, and you're hearing a lot about it maybe in the zeitgeist, uh, Washington and in DC, there's lobbying to try to, to bring this to the forefront. And really, it's just the, um, the notion that to make in impactful um, collaborative research in this environment, in this climate, and to sort of bring in all this new um, technology, we need to start working together. And so really, it's the idea of bringing multiple fields, particularly um, what I like to call the physical and hard sciences, the chemistry, the physics, the math, the engineering, to the biology and to the biomedical research to really take the, the fundamental um, discoveries we make in biology and rapidly transform them and rapidly translate them either into commercial ventures, into therapeutics, uh, into, into ways that we can't even potentially predict because of our silo, um, silo group. And so in 2013, the Raymond and Beverly Sackler uh, Foundation um, uh, endowed the laboratory at Tufts University uh, with the idea of, of really trying to make impactful research um, that would actually um, be collaborative and have um, a large impact across society. Um, and they really kind of said at that point, you know, do what you wish with it. And, and given um, our, our focus on cancer, and given that cancer right now is really at a, a precipice of really making a, a fundamental change in the diagnosis and the treatment of the disease, um, and, and our efforts, we, we came together and created a group of individuals that span um, multiple disciplines to tackle cancer as the first project. Um, obviously, we'll see how this goes in the future. We might expand to other diseases, but given our focus, um, the group has assembled um, to really start to battle cancer. And so the vision that we set forth was um, rather than say, okay, here's one cancer type, let's go, let's go work on it, uh, let's take the expertise of the individuals in the group and, and actually uh, use that to then sort of step back and, and come up with new ways to think about cancer, to uh, model cancer, to develop therapeutics or test cancer, and then to rapidly translate that into the clinic. And so how are we doing that? Well, uh, for example, we have a group of individuals that we call the, the, the data health um, team. And uh, Andrew Beck, um, uh, Anthony Filipakis, and Piyush Gupta um, are actually brilliant computational mathematical geniuses um, in their respective fields. 
And they basically um, take bioinformatics and machine learning and artificial intelligence. And they're using this um, in ways to develop new wellness products, um, improved therapeutics, and creating sophisticated algorithms uh, to uh, determine uh, therapy efficacy. And, and so if you uh, interact or, or chat with any of them, you'll, you'll see that they're, they in themselves have their own labs, but they're actually taking this um, technology and these ideas and, and bringing it a larger forth. So for exam example, um, Andy has uh, pioneered artificial intelligence uh, to sort of revolutionize pathology. And he's created um, wonderful machine learning algorithms to be able to scan through slides, um, very much as pathologists do, but the machine is doing it and then can be able to, to rapidly determine whether or not it's a malignant um, disease or whether it's, it's normal. Um, uh, Anthony uh, leads a, a group of, of 80 uh, coders at the Broad who is taking very large um, databases and, and, and sequencing data and expression data and really trying to mine in, in new and sophisticated ways. And one of the challenges we put forth to him was whether or not he could take his team and his ideas and see whether or not there's any information to be gleaned in the area, for example, of immunotherapy. Um, when you collect uh, information, large quantities of data from a single, from a single individual and then you uh, look at that across multiple individuals, can you determine what it is about that um, the mutation or the gene expression or the, the genetics of an individual that allow it to, for example, uh, immunotherapy, respond to it or not respond to it? And uh, Apush Gupta has actually uh, undertaken a, a really interesting idea, which is um, looking at large data sets to determine whether or not embedded in that information is information about therapy efficacy and which patients might respond to a therapy uh, prospectively rather than having to embark on a clinical trial to determine that. And so that's just giving you an idea of, of what they're doing. Other ideas that they're thinking about is, is can, can any of this information and technology they're developing be used as in wellness apps and, and actually make it into the palm of your hand and, and, and convert your iPhone into, into um, uh, a diagnostic um, uh, reader in, in that sort. So, you know, that, that's sort of one area that the group is looking at. We have another group, which is the diagnostics and therapeutics team. And really, these are um, uh, individuals who have a real close tie with the clinic. They have their own research interests, but they also um, uh, uh, see patients, treat patients, and understand the ins and outs of clinical care for cancer care. And so Dijon Jurek, uh, Vicky Seawalt, and Gaurav Gupta are all um, oncologists in one sort of another. And so they rapidly um, allow us to um, access their, their, their clinics and their clinical samples and their diagnostics and use some of the technologies and ideas that we're thinking about to rapidly translate them into the clinic. And we have a very large group that's focused on um, what we're calling broadly as technology development. And really, these are individuals um, such as Josh Kritzer at Tufts in the chemistry department, Irene and, and, and George, uh, David um, also in the uh, Tufts at the engineering department, um, to really uh, use their expertise and their um, backgrounds to come up with new technologies and new ways to think about cancer to, in Josh's case, to maybe come up with small molecule inhibitors or novel uh, drugs to inhibit uh, cancer growth. Uh, Irene, to image it. Um, she's a very sophisticated um, bioengineer that focuses on imaging. And are there new ways and new um, tools that one can develop to image cancer beyond our standard mammography or MRI or CT scans? And she's really coming up with some innovative ideas. Uh, and David Kaplan, um, one of our stars at Tufts with uh, 3D tissue engineering, can we use some of his technologies to create tissues in the lab and, and, and use those tissues as a, as a, um, a means to, to create cancers, to test uh, therapies, to look and understand progression? And then we have uh, another group of technology developers um, who, who create model systems. And you'll hear about Steve Elish, um, his pioneering technologies that span um, so many different areas. So I don't want to talk about that. But um, having a group like this also embedded in the Convergence Lab really brings together um, different uh, expertise, different perspectives, and hopefully will make a, a larger impact. And so what are we focusing on as a group? Um, well, there's um, a pretty short list, and it's not the exhaustive list, um, but really, you know, using our strength, and, and that is uh, tissue engineering and, and hydrogel fabrication to create uh, human tissues in, in the laboratory and see whether or not these tissues can be used as platforms for understanding disease, for, for testing drugs, for predicting drug efficacy. 
um, uh, personalized diagnostics, um, uh, peptide um, mimetics and library uh, designs for um, either chemical screening or our, our um, target identification and, and target um, th therapy. Um, the creation of, of various molecular tools for custom libraries for just general biology understanding, CRISPR libraries, expression libraries, um, and a lot of these really pioneered by um, Steve Elledge's group and Josh LeBaire's group. And then uh, NAPA protein arrays, that's also um, a really interesting and, and wonderful technology um, that Josh has developed, and using these to um, understand and, and probe even some fundamental biology as well as, as transformative translational biology. And so um, I'm happy to speak with any of you individually one-on-one -on -one, to give you more details of any of the specific projects, but what I'm going to use the rest of the time to talk about today is really how we're using some of this convergence um, work and some of the folks in the convergence group um, and how we've collaborated um, to uh, understand something that my laboratory is interested in, I'm interested in, which is the um, origins of, of breast cancer. And um, while there is a lot to appreciate with the idea that um, therapy, treating and, and defining drugs that will treat breast cancer or cancers in general is a very honorable and, and daunting task. Um, one of the things that I think is, is clear is that if we can prevent cancer in the first place, we're actually going to save a lot more lives. And, and um, prevention is, is one of these areas that's really difficult to, to study um, because you have to understand the disease in its infancy before it's even pathological. Um, and so to do that, um, the first thing is, well, how do you model something that you can't see in patients? And so uh, one of the things that um, the, the convergence group, and in particular collaborations between um, my laboratory and these folks, have been trying to do is develop models to study early disease, early cancer, and then use those models to then understand and define specific mechanisms that are involved in, in fueling those cancers with the ultimate goal potentially of then using that information to treat existing cancers that may have relied on those um, pathways to form in the first place. And so um, one of the um, areas that we've been looking at is how do we model early stage disease? And in breast cancer, an early stage disease is what's referred to as ductal carcinoma in situ. It's really when the cancer cells um, uh, grow inside the lumens of the duct and fill in the ducts. And at this point, the disease is, is actually curable. I mean, women show up with ductal carcinoma in situ, they get it removed, and, and they're cured. However, once it progresses to invasive ductal carcinoma, then the, the horse is out of the gate, and, and then you're basically um, treating the disease like uh, any other cancer. Um, and while there's been a lot of um, improvements on detection um, and treatment, um, we don't understand this transition. And if we could actually stop this transition, we could actually stop um, a, a lot of women from having to go through um, cancer treatment and, and possibly uh, life-threatening disease. And so the human breast, um, and, and my laboratory focuses mostly on human, um, primarily because the mouse um, models and the rodent models really don't recapitulate the human breast and the disease quite accurately, either anatomically or genetically. And this is just showing you what the human breast looks like. Um, and, and it's very complex. It's very heterogeneous. At any one time, you have structures in various forms of maturation. And, and what you can see here is with uh, cell lines and with other um, sophistications, our goal is to try to recreate these structures in three dimension uh, through tissue engineering. And so the way this is done is we isolate uh, cells from women undergoing reduction mammoplasties in the clinic. Um, and these are either Vicky's patients or, or patients here at Tufts. These are normal tissues, presumably disease-free. We isolate uh, the epithelial cells into little organoids. And then we actually uh, embed these organoids in, in these um, extracellular matrix hydrogels. And so these are um, engineered fabricated gels that compose of matrix that's very similar to what's found in the human breast. And what's really interesting about these hydrogels as opposed to the, the standard commercial collagen or matrogel or, or other um, ECM um, scaffolds that you see is the complexity of outgrowth that you see when you embed human cells in these hydrogels. And this is just showing you today's standard uh, technology, matrogel or collagen, you really have stunted growth. But in these, in these hydrogels, um, you really get much more elaborate, um, complex structures that are actually very reminiscent to what you actually see in the woman's breast. And so you have these immature lobules and these much more elaborate mature lobules. 
And um, additionally, these hydrogels really offer a level of, of resolution to understand cell biology and morphogenesis that's really been unprecedented. And you're looking here at just some um, phylloidin staining, so staining of the cell uh, membranes and, and structure uh, of these hydrogels growing in three dimension. And I think you can appreciate the complexity and, and heterogeneity of these structures um, that's been never been foreseen. And you can stain these structures with markers that you see in human breast tissues. In this case, we're looking at uh, green cells, which are the myoepithelial contractile cells of the breast. Uh, in red, you have the, um, the luminal cells, the milk-producing cells. And so you can see in, in three dimensions in these scaffolds, you can really appreciate and see the, the local. And so what you can see here, um, and hopefully at the level of, of precision and resolution that I don't think we've ever been able to see before, is you can actually see inside um, the cancer cells were actually injected within this lobule, and they've clearly migrated inside into other lobules of the structure, and then you can actually see now on a single cell level microinvasion into the, into the hydrogel structure. Um, and this is really amazing now because we can study this disease and we can isolate these cells and single cell sequencing, and you can imagine the things that we can do uh, now that we have um, accessibility to this kind of structure. Moreover, um, we're studying the nature of what, what's the difference between a non-invasive uh, cancer cell versus an invasive cancer cell, and what does that do to the structure? And so you're looking here again at the three-dimensional um, reconstitution of, of, again, here in red, you're looking at um, normal human breast epithelial cells from reduction mammoplasties, micro-injected with uh, green cancer cells. Um, and in here, this non-invasive cell line, it actually only migrates within the ducts from lobule to lobule and stays confined within the structure. But what's really remarkable is if you look at an invasive cancer cell line injected into the structure, not only does it invade out into the matrix, but in through the different um, lobules, but it also fundamentally transforms the structure, the normal structure of the breast tissue. Um, maybe potentially leading to the idea that this invasive uh, phenotype that one sees in the clinic could be actually coming from the inside out um, and not necessarily just from the cancer cells that have invaded out. And so again, we're at a time now and, and the convergence lab is in a place now where we can start to study some of these questions use this um, platform to t test therapies, uh, look for inhibitors um, and drugs that, that prevent that. And, and to sort of tantalize the idea of looking at inhibitors, um, what you're looking at here is um, the, the same, uh, these are static images of the human breast tissues that have been micro-injected with cancer cells. And you can see over time how the cancer cells invade out into the hydrogels. And in this case, we've inhibited a specific gene that we've identified to be involved in that invasive switch. And you can see that when you do that, um, you, you can, genetically, you can actually prevent the invasive progression. And so I think this now may even serve as sort of a rapid, high-throughput fashion to, to test uh, therapies that would prevent um, progression. And so, the, so that's one model and, and one system that we're, we're, we're using to understand this disease. Um, another uh, model and, and system that we're using to understand breast cancer, um, and, and particularly the origins and the etiology, is the human and mouse model um, that uh, we developed many years ago in my laboratory and have since then been using it for a number of different applications. And so the human and mouse model is really a similar approach to the hydrogel system, with the exception that now we're actually looking inside of an animal, a mouse, and so we can, we can include the physiology uh, and the histology um, on, on that level. And so this uh, enables one to take an immunodeficient mice, mouse, clear its endogenous mammary epithelium, and then humanize the uh, fat pad so it actually resembles and recapitulates human breast tissue. And then we can isolate the human breast epithelial cells, and plant that into the humanized gland and recreate normal tissues, um, pathological tissues, cancer tissues. We can also make milk in these animals, um, but not nearly as well as we can in 3D. And so just showing you here, um, these, human, uh, these human and mouse tumors that we've created, and we've created these from genetically modifi modification of, of human cells. Um, although uh, you've probably seen the literature, patient-derived xenografts, you can actually take tissues from cancers and implant them, but we've actually been making cancers de novo from normal cells. Uh, human tumors are very heterogeneous, and uh, you can appreciate that we get the same level of heterogeneity and hormone expression um, that one sees in the clinic. And so other uses for these models that we've been using them for has been to screen for genetic 
um, the drivers of, of breast cancer, oncogenes, tumor suppressor genes, um, looking at epigenetic and chemical libraries and perturbations and how that affects uh, early progression and cancer formation. And then one can also use this platform for drug discovery and testing um, uh, certain therapies that are targeted for the genes that we created uh, in the model in the first place. And so just showing you one example of, of an experiment and a strategy that we're using this platform to understand, and that is um, one of the things that we don't know about cancer yet, although we've sequenced the genomes, we don't know what, can what genes actually are causing and driving the cancer. We can catalog what they are, but we don't know causal cause and effect. And so we've been uh, taking advantage of Steve Elledge's, um, among his many libraries, he's created a, a CRISPR library that targets 500 putative tumor suppressor genes. He's also created another library that targets oncogenes. And we've been using these libraries to infect the cells um, and then do an in vivo screen to identify which genes cooperate together to give you a cancer. And do those genes have any uh, role in uh, the cancer behavior, the cancer phenotype? And so we, we take his library, we introduce it into mice, and then we can isolate um, the tumor cells and, and, and sequence the, the, the genomes of these, um, of these tumors and identify the guide RNAs or the expression construct or whatever we put in to identify the genes that are causal in the cancer forming process. We've also used these models to identify the cellular precursors to human breast cancer. And the reason this is valuable is because if, if one thinks about the progression and the evolution of cancer, it's likely the case that that initiating cell, whatever it is, um, its state, its differentiation program, its sensitivity to cell death, its response to proliferation, gets carried along during the cancer progression format process and ultimately, when you want to treat it, some of that information might still be retained. And so you could use that as, as, an, um, as a foundation for targeted therapies. And so um, at the time before we, we did this work, um, and in some cancers, this is still the case, it's thought that um, different precursor cells in a tissue um, gives rise to different cancer types. And so in the breast, the idea was that a luminal progenitor cell would give rise to luminal tumors and a basal progenitor cell would give rise to basal tumors, and it's really the intrinsic precursor cell state that is responsible for tumor heterogeneity. The other model at the time that existed was, no, it's actually um, the precursor cell is the same for all cancers, but it's really the constellation of genetic alteration that that cell sustains that drives the heterogeneity. And so in breast cancer, you could imagine that there's a luminal gene set that gives you luminal tumors, a basal gene set that gives you basal tumors. Um, and, and there's actually examples that support both of these models in the literature for both breasts as well as other diseases. Um, and so it might not be mutually exclusive. And so um, about a year, 10 years ago, we decided to, to look at this in the context of breasts. And so we used the human and mouse model where we either sorted out different populations of cells and, and put in different cooperating oncogenes and looked at the resulting tumors. Or we started with the same pool of, of precursors and we looked to see if we modified the genetic combinations where we get different types of tumors. And the results from, from a lot of work is really the idea that both of these models in breast cancer are playing an effect. Um, the vast majority of breast cancers, about 95 to 99 percent of breast cancers, are arising from the luminal progenitor population. And it's really the constellation of genetic alterations that are cooperating with each other that drive tumor heterogeneity. But there's an exception with the, a rare population of breast cancers that are referred to as metaplastic breast cancers, about 1%. These tend to arise from a different precursor population, a basal progenitor cell, and that no matter what genetic combination you put into this cell, you always get rise to a metaplastic tumor. And so it could be the case in other diseases and other cancers, you also have this, this, this dual, this third model where both of these are in operation, and the key will be to identifying what the originating precursor cell is. So for breast cancer, if, if this is the case, if the vast majority of breast cancers are coming from a luminal precursor cell, then it begs the question, how do you get such tumor diversity, heterogeneity, differences in response to therapies, um, and so uh, one of the things we've been looking at is the role that specific mutations and specific genes play in this. And we studied BRCA1 um, because it is uh, primarily involved in this basal gene uh, <coughs> program that gives you these basal-like tumors, which are very poor prognostic 
um, tumors, very little therapy. And here what we discovered was that actually the genetic predisposition, so the initiating genetic mutation or alteration that that precursor cell receives, sets the stage and sets that cell on a path to becoming a tumor of a specific phenotype. And in the case of BRCA1, that was the basal-like phenotype. And so why was that? Well, when we looked at uh, women who carried BRCA1 mutations and we looked at their normal <coughs> breast tissue, what we found was um, uh, before there was any evidence of cancer, and so these are essentially the precursor cells to cancer, we already saw evidence of, of uh, defects in differentiation. And most notably, we saw that um, in these normal cells um, that they had upregulated the transcription factor slug. And at the time, we'd also <coughs> gone on and shown that this transcription factor slug was also expressed in basal-like breast cancers, those from BRCA1 patients as well as others, and that if you actually inhibited slug, you could actually shift the differentiation state of the cancer, going from um, a, a basal-like tumor to one that expresses more luminal-like features, which is much more treatable and has a better prognosis. We then went on to show that um, slug, the transcription factor itself, was actually required for cancer formation in the first place. Um, and this was pretty unexpected and profound. And so what you're looking at here is, is survival of mice um, whose genetics um, background is either wild type or, or slug deficient. And they're just on a, a mammary tumor prone background. And so wild type mice develop tumors very quickly. Uh, mice that no longer have slug actually fail to develop tumors at all. And what's more interestingly is they also fail to transplant. And so what the role of this protein was suggesting was that it actually is involved in the early stages of uh, stem cell factors, stem cell programs that are required to initiate a cancer, to go from a normal cell to then one that's poised to become cancerous. It has to turn on a stem cell program. And so using mathematical modeling, again, the convergence idea of bringing other disciplines, um, we were able to uh, model the probability and the stochastic transitions uh, by which cells go from different states, from stem states to differentiation states, and quantify that, and use that information then to help us understand that um, the role of slug. And, and fundamentally, it is a transcription factor whose role is to allow cells to acquire plasticity and stemness so that they can continue to replicate in the background of mutations and DNA damage. And what was most profound is that that initial mutation in the case BRCA1 was really the trigger in, in, this, in this familial group of cancers um, to be poised to go into that direction. Uh, mechanistically, we showed how this worked, involved um, modifying chromatin, and if you want, we can talk more about this offline of the details. And so um, this really begins to set the stage in the understanding of an, in early disease and in early cancer, you really have this, this state where the precursor cell um, and the fate of that precursor cell is really important for whether or not it, it will be destined to form a cancer. And um, in the case of BRCA1 and slug, um, that really suggested the idea that a precursor cell, uh, when it activates a factor involved in stem cells, can actually acquire this, this more this plasticity and give you a, a poor prognosis tumor type. But is it the case that in other cancers, um, you have a different type of plasticity, and that might also give you a different kinds of tumors? And so here, uh, collaborating um, with um, Josh LeBaire's group, um, he created a, a, a library for us, a, a thousand transcription factor libraries, um, human transcription factors that we pooled together, and we used to identify genes that were involved in that plasticity that would allow luminal cells to acquire basal characteristics. And um, after doing this screen with a thousand genes, we actually got a very short list of 50, and one that really came out um, and was tantalizing was um, this uh, protein called TAS. Um, WWTR1. Um, I'm going a little quickly here because much of this is published and, and I'd like to leave room for, for questions and we can talk offline. Uh, TAS is becoming a really hot and exciting um, protein because it's part of this HIPPO pathway, um, which is really um, turning out to be essential for, for cancer formation, um, for stemness, um, for a variety of, of physiological processes. And what we went on to show was that TAS was um, a really important mediator of switching fates of, of cells. 
And so luminal cells in the breast could switch and become a basal myoepithelial cell um, simply by expressing TAS. We went on to show mechanistically that um, this was because TAS was um, binding to uh, critical components of the SWIFT SNF complex, both Brahma, BRM, and, um, and BRG1, and that this function of TAS was involved in, in controlling lineage gene expression. And so in a cancer perspective, this becomes an interesting and valuable target because uh, TAS is um, amplified and overexpressed preferentially in basal-like breast cancers. Again, the, the cancer that um, has very little um, targeted therapies. And so this gene that seems to be involved in, in, in conferring that basal phenotype is also selected for in cancers um, of the basal subtype. And moreover, um, its expression is actually statistically significantly correlated with poor prognosis. And so tumors that have high TAS expression uh, do much worse clinically than those that have lower um, TAS expression. And so this sort of um, is, is illustrating um, the point about how some of the fundamental biology of understanding uh, cell fate, stem cells, and early disease um, can be um, used and, and, and um, propped up with the convergence group. And so now that we are learning this biology and, and something we're going to continue to do, you know, some of you in the audience are really interested in how is this going to benefit patients? How are we going to be able to use um, this in therapies? Um, you know, our lab has been really identifying transcription factors, which actually are useless commercially because you can't target these. And this is where the help of, of, of individuals like Josh Kritzer, who, who have innovative ways of targeting transcription factors, might be one way that we can um, find ways uh, chemically to inhibit them. But another way we can actually uh, inhibit these transcription factors is understand how they're regulated in the first place, and maybe their regulators can be targeted. And in the case of slug, um, what we've discovered is that um, the DSLA CERT2 is actually a critical regulator of slug protein levels and its stability. Um, and that if um, one looks at um, protein uh, slug turnover, um, when CERT2 is expressed, it maintains very high elevated levels of slug. And when CERT2 is inhibited, slug rapidly um, declines. And what's more interesting about this is just as um, TAS was genetically selected for in basal-like breast cancers, um, CERT2 is genetically um, selected for in basal-like breast cancers. And you can see that there's an amplification of CERT2 in the basal-like breast cancers, high expression by gene expression, and even by protein, the triple negative breast cancers have much higher levels of CERT2. And finally, is this even a, a therapeutic option? Well, when in the lab showed that if you inhibit CERT2, um, you can actually profoundly reduce um, tumor growth and tumor formation, um, suggesting that potentially that this could be um, a novel way to uh, achieve slug inhibition by affecting CERT2 level. Um, and so we can get a way around targeting transcription factors by finding the enzy enzymes or, or kinases that regulate them and then targeting those. And so with that, I'd like to acknowledge um, the members of, uh, current members of my lab, prior members of my lab, collaborators, and obviously some of the convergent folks that were involved in this work. Um, the current members of my laboratory here, I spoke about some of the work that um, former members, Patty, Sarah, Adam, Lisa, um, carried on. Uh, Wen had done the really uh, lovely uh, CERT2 work. Um, Anya and Janelle are doing some of the CRISPR and Oncogene library screens. Uh, and obviously the Convergence Lab uh, members who were involved in this work, Piyush Gupta, Andy Beck, um, Vicky Seawalt, Josh LeBear, and Steve Elledge. And we're hoping that um, other groups are going to converge around um, other areas as well. And then finally, I'd like to end with the funding source for my laboratory, uh, the Raymond and Beverly Sackler Lab, obviously, but then the other um, grant funding sources that have allowed me to continue this, this line of investigation. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. <laughs> yes. Uh, quick question. Will these tiny gel uh, not less expensive. <laughs> um, it's, so, so Matrigel is um, essentially uh, an undefined um, uh, extracellular matrix preparation that's actually um, created from tumor. 
So in mice, they're injected with a tumor. This tumor secretes a lot of matrix, and that matrix is then harvested, purified, and bottled as matrigel. It's primarily laminin as its major component. The hydrogels are actually, um, uh, the base is actually collagen, but then it's actually infused with various molecular weights of hyaluronin, um, various uh, other extracellular matrix proteins like fibronectin, um, uh, escaping me all the diesel, but various specific defined extracellular matrix components. And then on top of that, there's actually certain growth factors that then are added to it. So it's a very defined, um, a defined matrix. The other thing about it is major gel, you just kind of stick it in your well and, and you let it harden. Um, the hydrogels have to be fabricated, so it, it goes through multiple steps to actually go from collagen one to these, these hydrogels, and then you have to actually, you know, scoop them out and they contract, so it's a little bit more sophisticated than just major gel or even just collagen for that matter. But it's highly reproducible um, because you can define everything and you, you everything sort of specific concentrations, specific times, and so it's major gel, it's lot to lot variability, it's, you're kind of at the whim of the mouse, and here everything is really um, systematic and, and reproducible. So for what I've been showing you right now, it's all been exclusively in vitro. Um, we are uh, taking some of the structures we've created and putting them into mice and seeing if putting them in animals in vivo uh, allows or alters progression, transformation. Um, so those experiments are ongoing. So you can actually do both because it's, it's such a amenable um, method. But right now, most of what I've been showing you has been in vitro. So we haven't yet, so the short answer is we haven't yet focused on the factors in the matrix, with the exception, um, and this is where Irene's going to come and, and help us out a little bit, with the exception that we can visibly see something happening to the collagen. So there's actually a physical force and, and dynamics that's taking place in those hydrogels that we can um, presumably image and quantify, and so Irene's going to try to help us do that. Um, we've been focusing more on what the cells are doing and, you know, um, whether or not there's been changes in cell fate, cell differentiation. Um, we've looked at it, so the invasion process we know is MMP, so we've done sort of active MMP assays to look at degrading the matrix. Um, but we haven't yet really focused on whether or not there's other matrix components being deposited and, and sort of what's the fate of the collagen and the fibronectin and the hyaluronin and all these other components that we've put in. So uh, much to be done. Right now, um, everything I've been showing you has just been um, epithelium. So it's a combination. So we've, I should also mention we've done this with single cells, so it doesn't have to be organoids. But we find the organoid uh, seems to preserve the niches of the stem cells, and so you get much more elaborate, complex structures. They're primarily enriched in epithelial cells, luminal and myepithelial. Um, we are working on incorporating some fibroblasts. I mean, that's what's actually really great about these, these gels is you can put in immune cells, you can put in any cell type you want and start under, studying the heterotypic interactions of those. But right now, it's really just been at the level of just the epithelial cells. That was my, I was going to do a follow-up question. Caroline's touched on this. So going back to your bioreactors, thinking about something that's not cancer, but to make milk, yeah. right? I mean, one of the major components of breast milk immune. is the immune component. Yeah, yeah. So, can you envision how that would work on a, on a more industrial scale? Or? So this is this is this is this is going to be our next one of the next convergence meetings is when we talk yeah. to the engineers. How, first of all, how do we scale it up? And is there second, a for silk there? how do we yeah how do we scale it up? And then how do we also access the milk? Right, right now it's kind of confined in the lumens. Um, the, the the physiology of getting it out in animals is is well defined. But this is these are this is convergence. I mean, right here is is a beautiful example of how you would get convergence to solve those questions by asking the engineers and the physicists to come up with ways. Um, 
And so maybe next year, the year after, after we've met more, yes. we'll, 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 find, we'll find those bioreactors. Yeah, they'll be on. Well, it would seem to me you wouldn't necessarily have to do all of those things at the same time in the same bioreactor either. Right. I mean, if you were making a, a material like breast milk with multiple components. Right, right. But yeah, immune cells is something we've definitely been right. talking about, about because we, we're going to need that at some point. Yeah. But do we need the cells or do we need the factors that they produce? And so that's things that we can tweak right. and well, sort out. Yeah, as you well know, everything affects cancer, right? Mm -hmm. Cytokines and all of right. that. Right. Uh, further questions? If not, if, you, if you're shy, you can catch Charlotte at the break after the next talk. Um, so I think we'll move on now to, oh, let's, let's thank Charlotte. Uh <laughs>